apologies to people who are in my virology class and my mutant viruses from hell class. There will be a little bit of overlap here, but I'm trying not to do too much of that. Um, you probably also notice all of my gear. Um, I will be recording this and trying to post it to YouTube um, later on. Uh, but just as by way of introduction, and actually it's perfect timing as far as the NASA grant is concerned, is this video which some of you have seen before. Um, it's <clears throat> uh, not completely up to date, but it's close. Good sound in here. This you can ignore, <laughs> because as you may know, 2012 is not terribly soon. So, <laughs> I, uh, again, that was supposed to be the trailer for a film on viruses and basically how viruses have a bad rap and they're really good for us. As I, you see at the end, now coming soon, 2012 is true with also most research grants. Um, we didn't have enough money, so with any luck, we can tweak some of this NASA funding into maybe doing a little bit more fun PR. So I <clears throat> wanted to start out with 
what is a virus? Uh, probably a lot of you have some ideas on what a virus is, and those of you who are taking virology have heard some of this spiel before. But what most people think about viruses as being are very small, infectious, obligate intracellular parasites. So as, again, everyone in virology has heard, I've got a problem with most of this definition. Um, and whenever I put anything in quotes, it obviously means that I'm not that excited about it. Um, another one is simply a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein. Well, I just told you I'm making a film about why viruses aren't bad news. So I don't like that either. Uh, one that I do like, in fact, much better is the capsid encoding organism, um, also known as CEO, and I think this is absolutely brilliant by Patrick Fortier, who came up with this idea. Now, the CEO parasitizing on some other kind of organization and running the whole show, directing exactly how everything is working. So I think it's very appropriate. But also, this is a differentiation between a capsid encoding organism and a ribosome encoding organism. And ribosome encoding organisms are all the ones that you've talked about so far in this class, I assume, unless you've you know, gotten into some of the really bizarre things other than that. Uh, my favorite definition, which is not a terribly good one, but it's pretty encompassing, is a bag of nucleic acid. Very specialized bag and very specialized nucleic acid. So that's one, um, I think, much broader definition. The one that I actually particularly like, and I hope that everyone in virology is memorized, right? Ready for the exam? No. Um, we had this on the first one, um, is from Salvador Luria, which is basically kind of an extension of that bag of nucleic acid thing. Genetic element replicates inside cells and a specialized element for moving around between those cells. So that is clearly gone a long way away from the bad news wrapped in protein. And, and the whole idea and partly also reflected on this is when most people think about viruses they think about this little thing right here. The extracellular part, or what Luria calls the specialized element. This is that bag with the nucleic acid in it. But if you think about it, that's really not the whole story. It's only a very small part of that story, because the whole story is really an infection process whereby this, oops, pardon me, virion here releases its nucleic acid inside a cell. More of the nucleic acid and more of the bag is made, and that comes back out. So really, if you want to talk about a virus, it's really this whole sort of process here. Now, certainly one of the defining aspects of viruses, and the one that's really unique, is the presence of this bag the virion, which is present on the outside. So let's take a quick look at what those virions look like. Bag with nucleic acid in the middle. Um, various different kinds of nucleic acid, DNA or RNA, which is really fascinating. These are the only current organisms. Yes, we can argue if it's an organism. We can argue if it's alive. That's a different story for a different time, probably philosophy course. But here, nucleic acid, which codes for the genome. Everything that that virus needs to go through that whole replication cycle is in this genome, which is there. The bag on the outside, that's, uh, eventually I get this thing to work properly, uh, can be just protein. In this case, this is what I like to call the naked virus um, because it doesn't have a lipid envelope around the outside. And the enveloped virus, which does have a lipid envelope around the outside. But basically, the whole story is here that we've got a bag and a nucleic acid on the inside. That bag has to protect the nucleic acid on the inside, but it also has to get that nucleic acid to somewhere where it can actually replicate. And so these bags or capsids really have two jobs, protection and getting the genome to somewhere where the genome can do its CEO job, take over the whole cell, and get that cell to make more virions. This is paraphrased by 
Patrick Porter again. Ceci n'est pas un virus. Um, and the whole idea is this is not a virus. This is just the virion. Um, this is, in fact, a virus that I discovered, as Anna Louise mentioned, when I was doing a postdoc in Mark Young's lab at Montana State University in a sample that I collected from Yellowstone. Um, cool story that I may have a chance to talk about later, but if those of you who downloaded the notes notice there's like 150 of them or something like that, doubt we're going to get through absolutely all of them, even though I do talk quite quickly. So a couple of things about why viruses are really not that bad after all. Partly it's because there are ridiculous numbers of, and in this case it should really be virions, that you find in pretty much any environment. And the way that you do that is you go and look for nucleic acid. How do you look for nucleic acid? You take a fluorescent stain. A lot of you probably know about this from running gels. Again, the mutant virus is from Hell Lab. We stain our DNAs with gel red so they fluoresce. It's basically exactly the same idea, only you take a sample from an environment and stain it with a fluorescent dye that will only fluoresce once it binds to nucleic acid. And what you see when you do something like this, this is an example from seawater from Jed Furman's lab, is a couple of big dots. These are the boring microbes, so bacteria and archaea. Um, and then all of the little ones, these are the interesting ones. These are all your virions. And it should be really obvious that there are a whole lot more little dots than there are big dots. Um, and that gives you really good indication that there are a heck of a lot of these things out there. And we don't know what most of them are doing, which is really fascinating and I think a wide open field in terms of thinking about viruses and how they interact. You can count up those little dots. That's what undergrads or graduate students are for, is counting up little dots. Uh, and then do ridiculous back of the envelope calculations. And if you do those kinds of things, you get to pretty astronomical numbers, actually, of, of virions in natural environments. Anywhere from a million to 10 million per milliliter of seawater. There are a heck of a lot of milliliters of seawater in the ocean. So you can do this multiplication, and you end up with ridiculously large numbers, like 10 to the 31. 10 to the 31 is a number that I just can't deal with. Uh, and in fact, it's really hard to think about. But what this does mean, and again, hopefully we'll get, back, get to this a little later on in my lecture, is that because you have just these really massive numbers which are there, you also have massive numbers of infections, but most importantly, things that are really, really rare, that only happen one in a trillion times, one in a trillion is a lot smaller than 10 to the 31. So extremely rare events happen, and they happen with a very detectable frequency. Another way of thinking about this, and again to continue with the NASA connection, if you're just to take all these virions and line them up end to end, any guesses how long that would go? You've got the notes on the next page. Um, 20 million light years in length. That's just the estimated number of viruses in the ocean if you line them all up next to each other. That's like way beyond the next set of galaxies. That's crazy. Absolutely crazy kinds of numbers here. Um, so that's the big picture. Really, really, really big picture. What about small picture? Um, those of you who have probably seen this before, looks like a very familiar textbook probably, Molecular Biology of the Cell. It's an old edition thereof. Human genome. What's in the human genome? Viruses, exactly. Thank you, Patty. Um, so 8% of our genome is clearly viral. My genome, your genome, everybody's genome. 8% are very, very, very clearly viral. You could argue, and a lot of people do, that all the line and sign elements, those massively repeated elements, which are the retrotransposons, are derived from viruses. People could also say that the viruses were derived from the retrotransposons, chicken or egg kind of question. But that adds up to a little over 40% of our genome is these kinds of mobile elements, virus-like DNA. So we are virus, particularly if you consider the protein-coding genes, which are 1.5% of our genome. 
So 40 to 1.5. So we're not just virus. We're by the vast majority virus or at least transposable elements. Now, is this all junk? No, it's not all junk. And why? Lots of different reasons. But it turns out that a number of these virus-derived or retro-element-derived genes are really important for development, and particularly for the development of the placenta. There's a protein called syncytion, which is similar to fusion proteins that we just talked about in virology the other day, uh, which is very important for fusing cells together. And the placenta is this amazing organ that actually more than half of the people here are lucky enough to be able to have experience with. Some of the rest of us can't. Uh, but that organ can only form with the presence of one of these syncytion genes, which is clearly derived from an ancient retrovirus infection <clears throat> in the ancestor of all placental mammals, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago. So basically, without viruses, we wouldn't have motherhood, which is a pretty amazing fact, as far as I'm concerned. And it's not just us, all organisms. And in fact, when you look at most genomes of organisms, with very few exceptions, you'll find virus genes in these organisms. And in fact, I mostly work with the archaea because they're totally cool and amazing. And I'm sure Anna Louise has told you about how amazing archaea are. Uh, but pretty much all bacteria, all eukaryotes. Um, unfortunately, the vast majority of viruses are those that infect this little twig on the tree of life here. Yes, I know this tree of life is out, out of date, Anna Louise. I apologize. But <laughs> that's um, this little twig here represents all animals, and the vast majority of viruses that people study are those that infect these. Um, there's all kinds of interesting viruses to study that infect all the rest of these guys. So what do these viruses look like? And more importantly, how do you decide, other than a little green dot, um, what you're actually looking at here? So the real defining feature, as I mentioned before, with these viruses is the virion. And the virion is completely different than anything else we see in biology. Um, first from the scale, but also from the point of view of the geometry. And again, apologies to those of you who are in my virology class, but the virion's really just about geometry. And everyone has you know, relearned their geometry, or at least a few parts of it, in the virology class. Most virions look a lot like a soccer ball. Um, because it turns out that this is, this spherical symmetry is the best way geometrically to have the largest volume inside the smallest surface area. And if you think about nucleic acids, nucleic acids are really inefficient in terms of coding for proteins. So small surface area, large volume is really advantageous as far as viruses are concerned. But then there's a lot of variation on this theme. This is a dengue virion. These are the kinds of structures that you see if you just take those little green dots and put them under an electron microscope. The vast majority of them are, have these icosahedrally symmetric, basically close to sphere structures, and then tails at the end. And this tail is really important for the infection process, mostly because bacteria and archaea are kind of tough, and the way to get through them is using these kinds of tail structures. Um, there are a few other ones that have interesting different virions. This one, in the middle here, myxoma, is an example of a pox virus. And then the very first virus to be discovered is this tobacco mosaic virus, which has a very interesting helical structure, which turns out to be also a really good way geometrically for packaging your nucleic acid. This is what tobacco mosaic virus looks like on a quasi-molecular scale. Each of these little clogs here, um, and I think the clog's appropriate because it's a Dutch scientist in the late 1800s who originally identified tobacco mosaic virus, uh, which he had no idea what the structures looked like, of course. Uh, but here, these then fit into a helical structure of all of these proteins with the RNA basically wrapped around 
the inside of that. And this is a you know, classic example of how you have helical symmetry in order to package these nucleic acids. The other main kind of symmetry, as I mentioned already, is this icosahedral symmetry, where you have pentamers, which are the little <clears throat> pentagons that are part of your soccer ball, that are then arranged um, all the way around a lattice, which is otherwise made up of hexagons. As long as you have 12 pentagons in any hexagonal lattice, it will fold up into a closed structure. And if people are interested, I can send you the mathematics that are associated with that. I know you want to do mathematics as part of your microbiology class. Uh, but that allows you to wrap a structure together. And again, hope we'll get a chance to talk about some of our other structures a little bit later on. But the standard way to do that is with icosahedral symmetry and quasi-symmetry. And everyone can tell me about T numbers, all of you who are in virology. Um, so <clears throat> there are also some examples of these pleomorphic or bizarre structures. Uh, these are pretty typical viruses that have the envelopes around them. Very often, they're kind of blobs if you look at them under the electron microscope. And figuring out a high-resolution structure for some of these blobs actually turns out to be rather difficult. Here's another example of one of these um, different virions. So now I want to switch gears a little bit, talk about the life cycle of the virus. And again, you know, Anna Louise, maybe we can argue about what's alive and what's not, origins of life, et cetera. But from this point of view and your textbook, it's the viral life cycle. So we'll say that viruses are alive. But the virus replication process is really split into about five different steps. There's the attachment step, which is where the virion is going to bind to the host cell in order to be able to release its genome, and that's this entry step. And then the CEO, which is all part of that genome that comes in, reprograms the cell in order to make more virions. And that making of more virions is going to be the nucleic acid, which is shown here as this green rod, and then all of the proteins, which are going to make up your virion, all these little dots in the background here, these then somehow have to come together. And this is another incredibly virus-specific <coughs> process where all of these proteins will assemble into these amazing structures, which then will get out of the cell and go on and go through this whole cycle again. This is great in terms of cartoons, but how do you actually measure this kind of thing? Anyone virology? The plaque assay is one way of doing it, but plaque assays are part of usually a one-step growth curve. Exactly. So um, the idea here is that looking at one virus replication cycle, the one virion going to multiple virions, that's incredibly hard to do. And in fact, with current technology, we really can't do it. So what you do is you look at a population of viruses that are all infecting cells at the same time and hopefully synchronously replicating. And so if you look at this, just looking at the number of viruses here, and we'll talk about plaques in just a second, uh, over time, and you just literally take samples over time and look for the relative virus count. And this has been done for many different viruses. Starts out, you add virus, you see this long period where no virus, and this is now no extracellular virus is being produced, and then eventually those virions get out and you get to a plateau level where all of the virions in that one cycle have actually been produced. We're mostly interested in all the stuff that happens here in the relatively boring part of the virus replication cycle because that's where all the cool molecular biology takes place. And Anne Louise said I'm a virologist. I'm not really a virologist. Um, I just play one in movies. Uh, but it's actually true. My undergraduate degree is in chemical engineering, and I had one biology course as an undergraduate. So. Exactly. Don't believe a word of it, except for the fact that she's going to be asking you questions about it on your next exam. 
So um, we're, again, I'm very much a reductionist, so I'm very interested in the molecular aspects of what's going on in really this process here, making the genome, making the bag, how that bag gets put together, and yeah, then there's an infection thing that makes people sick. That's, that's stuff for people up the hill to worry about. Um, so <clears throat> how do you get an idea of number of viruses that you have there? And that's that plaque assay that I heard people talking about earlier. So these are a little hard to see. Can you see the plaques in the back? Yeah, okay. So the idea here is that really hard to see that one virion or the one actual infection. However, what you can do is look at multiple rounds of infection and see the effects of an infection. And the way that that's done is really very straightforward. It's kind of analogous to your colony forming units that you get on a plate if you're looking for bacteria. You take your bacteria, you dilute them, spread them out on a plate, and then let them grow for a while. And each individual bacterium on that plate will grow, it'll multiply, it'll make more, it'll make more, it'll make more, and eventually you'll see a little colony on your plate. This is now flipping that over and saying, okay, now we're going to look at a whole bunch of cells, but then the individual viruses that infect one cell, which will then infect other cells that are right around that, which will infect other cells that are right around that, and as long as there's something that you can see, and in this case it's actually killing off the cells which are there, then you can get an idea how many viruses you started with. So here is just the cartoon of how that works. Start with a mixture of your cells together with virus and something to make sure that the viruses can't get too far away. This is usually auger. Mix these together, put them on a plate, let it incubate. The cells will grow and at the same time the viruses will replicate. And what you'll end up with is a whole bunch of bacteria that's on the background here. And then these little dots, and these dots represent multiple rounds of virus infection. You can count the dots, and again, this is a great thing for undergraduates, graduate students to do. Count the number of dots, and then you can actually back calculate the number of virus particles, infectious virus particles you had here. This is an example of a real plaque assay that actually I did. Um, so it wasn't all the undergrads. Uh, this is from bacteriophage T4. All of these little tiny dots here um, in the background are different plaques. And how many plaques are on here? Too many to count, exactly. So um, the way that you also do these plaque assays, you do lots of dilutions of the virus that you start with, and you get to an actual countable number of plaques. This is a countable number of plaques. Um, you can do this not just with bacteria. It turns out as long as you have a virus which kills off cells. You can also do this with mammalian cells, with all kinds of other animal cells, as long as they'll grow as some kind of flat monolayer. And so here's a nice example from your textbook of different plaques, um, and then normally growing cells here in the background. Here's a real example from my lab. We're looking at the yellow fever vaccine um, and just doing dilutions. Here's a 10 to the minus 1 dilution, 10 to the minus 2, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, and you get to a reasonable countable amount here, and then can back calculate how much virus you started with in the first place. Um, and these are actually really pretty plaques. Most of my plaques look way uglier than this. I decided not to bring any of those today. So how do you get this plaque process? How do you get virus infection? So first step is binding to the outside of the cell. Virion has to bind to the cell. Turns out that viruses bind to pretty much, I should say virions, bind to pretty much anything that sticks out on the outside of a cell. And these are just a couple of examples here. Flagellum, we've got viruses that bind to flagella. We've got pili, we've got pili that have viruses that bind to. We've got transporters, transporters that have viruses that bind to them. LPS, we have viruses that interact with them. Um, all, basically, anything which is sticking to the outside of the cell over the probably billion years of evolution, you end up with something which the virus has figured out how to take advantage of getting inside the cell. Now, none of these, as far as we know, cell surface molecules 
are something that have evolved so that they do get virus infection. And there's always kind of a trade-off between how some of these things work. One of my favorites of these, and again, apologies if some of you have seen this before, um, is bacteriophage T4 and the bacteriophage T4 infection process where, uh-oh, this is maybe not working. Eh. It shouldn't be giving me fine china. That's not what I'm looking for. Okay, well, um, if you can go and look for bacteriophage T4 infection, um, you can see this amazing conformational change that happens in the proteins in the tail where the genome actually literally gets injected through the membrane. Um, and those of you who are in the <clears throat> virology course can tell your neighbors about what's wrong with that particular one. So um, bacteriophage T4 releases its genome. It gets literally pushed through the membrane and then released that then genome gets replicated. And this is one of the first sort of weird and bizarre tricks that these genomes do. So gets inside the cell, the genome gets replicated, fascinating process that we don't have time to get into. Oh, that's, maybe I should, uh, maybe I should read this about my, my favorite little giant microbes here. You guys all know giant microbes? Your friends and family need um, stocking stuffers, Christmas presents, et cetera. Um, these are really good ones. Um, but since I couldn't show you the video, maybe I should just read what the little blurb. Have you guys heard this before? Have I told you this? You've read it before? OK, so this one's a lot of fun. Uh, well, I think so anyway. Clearly, they asked someone who knew something about bacteriophage T4 when they put this together. So facts, not alternative facts, facts. T4 bacteriophage may look like something out of a science fiction movie, but if you're an E. coli bacteria, it's the stuff of your nightmares. This real life microscopic monster isn't just hiding under your bed, it's hunting you. Feeling for you with its six deadly feet. When they finally touch your skin and know that you're there, they grip onto your flesh like talons. Paralyzed with fear, you wait and watch as a tremendous tusk-like stinger stabs you mercilessly through the middle. Writhing in pain, you feel your predator's deoxyribonucleic acid, <laughs> DNA being injected slowly, menacingly into your very being. You try to resist, of course, but it is futile. Your contaminated body starts to grow new copies of the malevolent abomination that has corrupted your soul. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> In less than an hour, a legion of fiends is swarming inside you. They grow and grow and grow until you are broken, until finally you explode, disappearing into a void of nothingness. Now, this is, I'm, I'm, just, I'm literally just reading this. <laughs> this is, it's not my words, theirs. By day, T4 has played important roles in a number of scientifically significant experiments. It has hobnobbed with Nobel Prize winning scientists and has whispered some of the secrets of mutation genetics to them. It's advanced our understanding of viral infection and may someday help to control pathogenic bacteria. But don't let the cool <laughs> scientific demeanor fool you. T4 always has one eye on the horizon, watching for the sun to set, waiting for the hunt to begin. So maybe some of your kids might not want to be reading this, but <laughs> amuse, amuse your friends and family. So um, <clears throat> that being said, it's a pity I didn't, didn't was, I should have pulled up the video before I came over here, but that, the, the whole tusk-like stinger um, going in, that's exactly what's in that animation, which is molecularly almost exactly correct. Uh, and quick, uh, so what's the problem with that video? Anyone remember? <laughs>
it's the wrong way around. So it's you know, clockwise versus anti-clockwise. And there are probably only about 100 people in the world that know that that's the problem with that. So, <clears throat> but yeah, what comes in? That genome comes in, it gets replicated. Fascinating kind of replication process. We don't have time to talk about it here. But one of the things that happens is the genome is made as many, many copies all lined up next to each other. And so basically what we're looking at here is the genes of the genome go A through G, and that G is hooked up right next to A, which goes through G, which goes to A, etc. And so this is a concatomeric genome. And this is very common in the replication of these virus genomes. You end up with multiple copies of the genome all attached end to end. One of the really weird things that T4 does is that it takes not just one copy of the genome, it takes a little bit more than one copy of the genome each time when it packages its genome. And this is what's called a, a head full packaging mechanism, which is to totally over anthropomorphize a really smart way to go. And basically what happens is you have this empty head and you stuff it until it's full. And then you chop off that piece of DNA, find another head, stuff it until it's completely full, and keep going. As long as the head is big enough, and in some cases actually a little bit too big, you'll have all the genes that you need in that one particular genome. But in the case of T4 and a number of other viruses, it, the head's actually a little bit too big. So you end up with a slightly bigger amount of DNA in each of those heads than you actually need. And so that's what's shown here, where we have this head full, which is slightly more, and in this case, just two genes more, than it actually needs. So any individual virion has slightly different DNA in it, but it's got all the genes that it needs, just because of the size of the head and the way that the DNA gets packaged inside of it. So it's a really fascinating process, and then just it's literally about size and geometry. Yeah, Patty. That's not important, yeah. You can all you know, check it out later on in your copious free time. <laughs> so because of this, you know, yeah, merciless virus guy here, looks so cute, um, there are lots of resistance mechanisms. Now, resistance is futile, yes, we know. But um, the idea here is that there are multiple different resistance mechanisms that have turned out to be incredibly useful for biotechnology, genome engineering, et cetera. And now, who would have thought that studying resistance mechanisms to viral infection of bacteria would turn out to be a multi-million, if not multi-billion dollar industry? So everything we know about restriction endonucleases comes from restriction. What the heck is restriction all about? Restriction of infectivity by viruses of bacteria. That's where the whole restriction and restriction enzymes comes from. It's restriction of infection due to viruses. So that process, of course, specific DNA binding proteins and cutting proteins. So this restriction modification system is a way that mostly bacteria, some archaea, resist. And then CRISPR, which is a whole lecture in and of itself, clustered, regularly interspersed palindromic repeats, um, but an amazing way of doing genome engineering that is now being used in all kinds of you know, plant cells, animal cells, maybe even human cells for doing genome engineering, all came from the study of resistance to infection by a bunch of these bacterial viruses. For us, and most animals, there's also immunity and RNA interference. All of these seem to be derived from escaping from these nasty predators um, who would be attacking us. So there are a number of different ways that the viruses, of course, have evolved to deal with these mechanisms. One of my favorites is also what happens in bacteriophage T4, 
So if you think about a restriction endonuclease, what do restriction endonucleases do? They bind to DNA sequences and chop them up. Well, if the virus has different DNA, it's not going to get chopped up by a restriction endonuclease system. And it turns out that bacteriophage T4 modifies its cytosine. Every single one of the cytosines in one of these guys' genomes is hydroxymethylcytosine. And almost no restriction endonucleases can cut a piece of DNA, actually can't even bind to a piece of DNA, that has hydroxymethylcytosine in it. So one way that you can have these kinds of <coughs> resistance mechanisms that are going on in terms of the bacteria and bacteriophage. Again, this stuff is all I'm trying to cover years worth of lecture in all one lecture here. So again, please slow me down, as some of you have asked questions already. Um, and we'll be skipping um, through a lot of these things here pretty quickly. Uh, bacteriophage T4, again, it's got this modified DNA here. Also, because it's got its own DNA modifications, T4 can get away with making its own endonucleases, which chop up any DNA that has cytosine in it. So when you have this, you know, the genome that comes in from this little guy, one of the genes that is made is a cytosine-specific endonuclease. So it actually chops up the whole host genome. And that's actually one of the ways you can see that you've got a, a virus infection taking place is the whole genome gets chopped into tiny little pieces, which is really good from the virus's point of view because it needs to have all those pieces of DNA, the individual nucleotides, in order to make the rest of the bacteriophage DNA. And then gets assembled, and this whole process is actually incredibly well understood, and the, there should be links next to that infection video where they look at all of the structures and how bacteriophage T4 actually gets um, completely put together. I mentioned the packaging process. This again is you start out with an empty bag here, the prohead structure, and then slightly more than one genome gets pumped into. And this pump, these ATP dependent pumps, which pump the DNA into these head structures, turn out to be some of the strongest molecular motors that anyone has ever detected and ever looked at. So they can package DNA to up to, I forget exactly the number, I think it's about a thousand PSI pressure of the DNA inside one of these heads. And I don't have a picture of it, but if you look at some pictures of bacteriophage that have been lysed with osmosis, so you just release the DNA, the DNA just sprays out of any of these heads. And that is how that infection process can actually take place. You have binding of the virus. As soon as a hole opens up at the bottom, the DNA just comes shooting into the cell. Because it's been built up with all this pressure, that was generated by this really strong motor when it's packaging the whole head um, with the DNA. Okay, so that's classic, what we call lytic viruses. These are the ones that blast open their host. But let's think back to our definitions at the beginning. All viruses need to have a host in order to be able to replicate. Well, if you're undergoing lysis and you're chopping up the host's genome, it's blasted apart when you're done with your whole process, that's not a really good way of maintaining your population if you're killing off all your hosts. So in the environment, most viruses actually don't replicate that way. So maybe you can you know, get your kids to sleep and say, no, and actually not most of them are that nasty. Most viruses just hang out. And if we think about, again, our genome, 40%, or at least 8% of our genome, are these viruses. So where do those come from? And what's going on there? There's a much more mellow way to undergo virus infection. And that's what's called lysogeny. And lysogeny happens through temperate viruses. So te classic temperate virus is bacteriophage lambda. 
I could have brought my book on bacteriophage lambda, um, also been studied, also uh, for many years, also hobnobbed with all kinds of Nobel laureates, et cetera. Um, so <clears throat> what bacteriophage lambda does, which is different from bacteriophage T4, is it can basically decide, again, totally over anthropomorphizing here, whether it does nasty replication and lysis, a whole bunch of virions, or it just hangs out inside the cell. And that's probably where most of those viruses that we have in our genome, most of the virus genomes that you see in all kinds of other host genomes, they probably come from some variation of this. A virus genome that's present inside a host genome is called a prophage. If it's a bacterial virus, bacteriophage is the original name for bacterial viruses. Came up with how many years ago? Most people in virology remember? Felix Terrell published this big paper in 1917, exactly 100 years ago. So happy birthday, bacteriophage. So prophage is a bacteriophage genome that's inserted in a bacterial genome. A provirus is where you have a virus inserted in usually a animal genome or some other non-bacterial genome. So this inserted genome is really, really, really common. Also, again, a provirus or a progenome. Any cell which has one of these viral genomes in its genome is called a lysogen. So let's look at that process here in a little bit more detail. Here is what's best known for bacteriophage lambda. Again, you have binding by the virion to the outside, release of the genome inside the host, but then this decision gets made. And how that decision happens, ask anybody in virology, they'll be tested on in their midterm on Wednesday. Um, so it can either replicate just like bacteriophage T4 does. Makes more of its genome, makes more of the protein, so it's get assembled, it goes out. This classic lysis pathway. On the other hand, it can also undergo lysogeny. And in this process, the viral genome is not replicated. It gets inserted into the host genome. And now, when this host replicates, the virus genome will just get replicated with it. And this, again, is probably how the vast majority of our proviruses in our genome, in all kinds of other bacteria, archaea, pretty much any other organism, they have this insertion event which has taken place here. In the case of lambda, there's another decision point which takes place. And that's what's called induction. And that's where you can have one of these proviruses start to get expressed, start to make many copies of the genome, start to make protein, and then go down this pathway. Now, the question is, how many of the viruses in our genome can undergo this process where they get activated and then come out and make more virus? The answer is, for our genome, none of them seem to be able to do this. And there are a number of reasons why that is. Uh, but this process, once you do have a virus inside your genome, it could, at least in theory, come back out and make more virus. And people have actually done this with some of the viruses in the human genome, um, taken these viruses and changed a few of the nucleotides, which seem to be mutated over the probably hundreds of thousands, in some cases actually probably less than that, um, years, and then get an infectious virus that comes back out. But for bacteria, this is a pretty common process. If you look at lambda, instead of having this process where you have headful packaging, turns out that lambda packages just exactly the right size of its genome. And the way it knows that is there are things that look exactly like restriction endonuclease sites, exactly one genome length apart. They're called the cohesive end sites. The reason they're called cohesive ends is because they're a lot like most restriction endonucleases. They provide single-stranded overhangs that can bind to each other in order to <coughs> give you a circular genome. So this is, what, this is what gets released inside the cell. 
if you undergo the lytic process, back up here, what's happening over here, this will replicate, make a whole bunch more virus genomes and lice the cell. If, however, it's made the decision that it's going to hang out inside the cell, there's a specific lambda protein, incredibly creatively named integrase, which takes this DNA, chops it at a separate place from the ends here, and then puts that into the genome. And this is that, that prophase, prophage now present in the genome. I think in the E. coli genome, there's something like 14 different prophages um, in E. coli. Most of them are non-active, but it turns out that the lambda bacteriophage was originally found when someone was growing what they thought was a non-infected E. coli, and then all of a sudden it started to make virus. So very often these you know, viruses hidden in genomes are, are pretty common. How does it go about doing that? This is a replication process which is very specific to viruses. Um, I just heard, any of you know about TWIV, This Week in Virology? Nice podcast on viruses. Highly recommend it. It's a little bit long, but other than that, it's, it's great. Uh, they talked a little bit, I think two weeks ago, about this replication process, which they call rolling circle. They call it the toilet paper model for how genomes get replicated. Um, so if you think about a toilet paper roll, um, it will just, you know, each of these is just getting spun off of your toilet paper roll because of the DNA polymerase, which is just, you know, cruising along here, your hand or your daughter's hand, in my case, um, is rolling the toilet paper roll. You get these continuous, now, concatomeric genomes, because each of those, you know, pieces of paper is one genome, um, that now gets spun off of this rolling circle replication process. Each of these individual genomes, one piece of paper gets taken off, stuffed into a head. Next one comes off, gets stuffed into a head. This case is a little different than the headful mechanism that we have with T4 because we have those very specific nucleotide sites that get cut and packaged into the head structure. So do you want to, I'll go through a couple more slides and then we'll take a break. Does that work? Okay. So um, just want to talk about some of the diversity that you see in some of these different viruses. So far, all that we've talked about have been the double-stranded DNA viruses. So bacteriophage T4, lambda, all of these guys have double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA is really easy to think about in terms of how it replicates, how you can get transcription taking place, et cetera. But, as I mentioned right at the beginning, that nucleic acid that's inside your bag isn't necessarily double-stranded DNA. There are quite a few single-stranded DNA viruses. FIX-174 is probably the best known of those. M13 is this long filamentous virus. And then we also even have some RNA viruses um, that are present. And these are all bacteriophages. These are all viruses that are infecting bacteria. This is what bacteriophage T4 looks like in a really amazing electron micrograph. Anyone who's done electron microscopy knows that getting pictures like this is really hard. Um, got this head structure together with the tail, these tail fibers. It's these tail fibers which are interacting with the host on the outside and then having the conformational change where this tail contracts and that's where you get the syringe-like action going inside the host cell. There are lots of other viruses that infect things other than bacteria. These are just a few of those examples. We've got double-stranded DNA viruses that don't have coats, those that do have coats, and lots of different RNA viruses. It turns out that there's probably way more RNA viruses that are infecting eukaryotes than there are infecting bacteria. Quite why that is is not entirely clear, but we have a couple of ideas um, as far as that's concerned. And this brings me to <clears throat> how these viruses replicate, particularly those animal viruses. Here, you can have pretty classic lytic replication. So the virion infects the cell. Now we can tell it's a eukaryote because it's got this nice nucleus. This infects the cell. The cell starts to make virus nucleic acid. 
virus proteins, and the cell bursts. Now, this is, turns out is a relatively rare mechanism for how viruses are replicating. <clears throat> Much more common, you have what's also called a persistent infection or a background infection, a chronic infection, where the virus just makes smaller amounts of virions and the cell just continually produces these virions. And it turns out that this is probably the case for most viruses that we're associated with. These are the infectious viruses are just being produced in this persistent infection state. But you also have these sort of lysogenic-like infections where you can have viruses hanging out in a cell and then some kind of induction event that leads to lysis. This is a classic case which happens with HIV causing AIDS is most of the time the HIV genome is integrated into the host, not much is going on, but when there's an induction you can have this massive increase in viruses and do get kinds of cells that get lysed. Okay, so the question is, because I'm recording, I'm just going to repeat it, uh, is basically, to try and paraphrase, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that how does the virus make the decision to... All right, so, so basically for Lambda, now all of you know this because you're studying this for the midterm, because <laughs> for next week, uh, but it has to do with the growth state of the cell. So if the cell is growing well, and this is just known for, for lambda, it's actually not known for most of these lysogens and how they get induced. But um, in the case of lambda, if the cell is growing well, then the virus actually goes down the lytic pathway. And the thought there is that if that one cell is growing really well, there are probably going to be other cells that are also growing well that the virus could go and infect later. If, however, the cell is not growing well, that's when it seems to go into this lysogeny pathway. And that also makes sense because if this cell is not growing well, there's probably not another cell nearby that will be able to be infected. So that's the, the hand-waving argument. And again, it's well known for lambda and E. coli. That's how it works. For the vast majority of these other temperate viruses that are replicating through the lysogenic um, pathway. We have no idea um, exactly how that's working. Okay, so um, switching gears a little bit. Um, this is one of the questions that I had in the quiz that we decided we're not gonna ask today. Woohoo! Uh, thinking about different kinds of viruses. And as I mentioned before, all the stuff I've talked about so far has been the double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA is great because we know how to deal with double-stranded DNA. That's what the cells deal with all the time. They've got the right machinery for replicating that DNA. They've got the right machinery for taking that DNA, making an RNA out of it. Then that gets translated and made into proteins. But a lot of viruses actually don't use double-stranded DNA inside their virions, inside the bag. And <clears throat> mentioned this before, but this is a part of the process which people have used, and particularly David Baltimore was the first one to come up with this, of a way to classify and think about different kinds of viruses. And it really focuses on the messenger RNA and how that messenger RNA is actually made. One of the things that I didn't mention at the beginning, and probably should have, I'll mention it now, is that all viruses are dependent on cellular translation. So right back at the beginning, I said you know, capsid encoding organisms, the CEOs, what you know, Patrick Fortier calls viruses, um, versus the ribosome encoding organisms. So all viruses to date, and partly to some extent people think about it as a definition of viruses, absolutely require cellular translation. No virus has been found to date that can do its own translation. So in terms of that obligate intercellular parasite stuff, translation is one of those really big things that has to happen. So it's not surprising you want to focus on the messenger RNA and how that messenger RNA is being made in terms of thinking about how different viruses function. So 
we already talked about these double-stranded DNA viruses. Double-stranded DNA viruses can transcribe really easily and make messenger RNA. So again, this is all the cellular processes. But now we've got all these other kinds of viruses here as well. Start out talking about these the class 1 through 6. I can never remember these numbers, so I don't expect you to either. And I hope that Ana Luis doesn't expect you to remember these either. Um, but there are six of them, actually, I think is a good thing to remember. And that's what I expect my virology students to remember as well. So it's all about what's in the virion. So this particular set of viruses has single-stranded DNA inside the virion. So if you've got single-stranded DNA, that's kind of worthless once it gets inside the host. Nothing can happen to it. You can't use the cell's translation machinery. So you have to have replication that takes place, taking this single strand and making it double-stranded. And we'll take a look at that in just a second here, how that works. But then you've got double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA can replicate. It can be used for transcription, et cetera. So that's a relatively simple way of thinking about things. And it's mostly cellular processes that do that. On the other hand, we've got all of these virions that have RNA in their genomes, or I'd say in their virions. So what's going on there? The easiest ones of these are those that have what is called positive strand RNA. Positive strand just means that's the RNA which can code for proteins. So as soon as that RNA comes inside the cell, that gets translated into protein. Great, wonderful. Um, except for the fact that you need to make more of that RNA in order to make virions so they can go and do another step. So one of the things that all of these positive strand RNA viruses has to encode in that strand of RNA is an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Cells don't have very good, anyway, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. So RNA-dependent RNA polymerase takes an RNA, makes an RNA copy from it. Cells don't usually do that. So that's what happens with the positive strand RNA viruses. But there are also negative strand RNA viruses. Negative strand RNA viruses have a problem. And that is the RNA that comes inside the cell can't be translated, because that's the opposite strand of the one which gets translated. So these viruses have to have their own RNA-dependent RNA polymerase protein which comes in with the genome. So the entry process has to include proteins as well as that genome. Once you have that RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, actually you're kind of probably better off because you can make lots of copies of little pieces of your negative strand RNA to make all the messenger RNAs that you need to make the protein. We also have double-stranded RNA that gets packaged inside virions. Turns out these guys function very similarly to the negative strand RNA viruses. And then there are these really bizarre ones over here. And these are the ones that David Baltimore, who I don't think is actually in that charade. I think he's one of the Nobel laureates who wasn't in the charade at the time. Uh, who discovered, together with Howard Temin, actually parallel, parallel with Howard Temin, that there were these really bizarre RNA viruses that needed to make DNA. It's like, whoa, OK, what's going on there? Now, of course, we know this is, these are the retroviruses that go through a DNA intermediate. So the retroviruses package RNA in their virion, but that gets reverse transcribed, so completely against the standard dogma, DNA goes to RNA to a protein, RNA goes to DNA. This DNA actually gets inserted into the host genome, which is also absolutely required for these kinds of viruses to replicate. And then the host polymerases will make RNA, and then eventually the RNA here, which gets packaged as part of the genome. So those are the six basic classes of viruses. There are some DNA viruses that also have RNA intermediates. Some people call that the seventh class. I don't like that particularly. But it's all about what kind of nucleic acid is packaged and how you make your RNA. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes talking about some of these different ones, the ones that are very specific to viruses.
And one of the best understood of those is bacteriophage Phi X174, single-stranded DNA virus. In fact, the very first complete genome sequence ever to be completed is Phi X174. And there was a big surprise when people sequenced the genome of this virus. You remember from virology what the big surprise was and what people called it? A message from outer space. In fact, there's a New York Times article talking about the Phi X174 genome as being a message from outer space. The reason for that is it turns out that there are parts of the genome where you have overlapping open reading frames. And so all three reading frames actually code for proteins which are in fact made by cells that are infected by this particular uh, virus. But um, I didn't really want to talk too much about that. I was much more interested in terms of thinking about how you have replication that can take place from one of these single-stranded DNA genomes. So what happens is the single-stranded DNA gets released inside the cell that becomes a double-stranded form through the activity of cellular proteins. So it's all cellular proteins that do this. Um, but then you have a viral protein that cuts just one of the double strands here, and that then gets made into single strands through, again, this toilet paper model. You have a DNA polymerase, which will extend and just keep going around and around, just rolling this man, toilet paper roll, and leaving off each of these single strands that comes off here. These single strands, once they get to a full-length genome, there's a virus protein that puts them back together, and then this can be packaged and made into new virions. So single strands have to become double strands and go back to single strands again. Why that is? Again, never ask why questions in biology. What's the answer to why questions? Evolution. Evolution. Thank you. Um, so they happen. They're there. We have to come up with some kind of explanation for it. And probably the main reason for that is that these are really small virions. And so it's a lot easier to package a single strand of DNA into one of these than to package two strands, half as much. So there's probably selection for keeping that very small. I have another idea on why that might be as well that we may have a chance to get to a little bit later on here. So <clears throat> this is the, this is a single-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA. This is the replication process that happens with these single-stranded RNA viruses. In this case, it's a positive strand. So this genome, once it gets released, can be translated directly. And these guys are supposed to be little ribosomes here that are translating away along this particular RNA. So any virus that has a positive strand genome, that can just be the genome that comes inside the cell. You don't have to have any particular modifications to it as long as it's got the right machinery, caps and tails and so on and so forth. And ask your colleagues who are taking virology, they'll tell you how all that happens. Uh, but now we have translation. This makes all of the proteins, including the one that you absolutely have to have, which is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That RNA-dependent RNA polymerase will now take the positive strand, make a negative strand copy from that, and that's because all polymerases always go 5 prime to 3 prime. So if you need a positive strand from 5 prime to 3 prime, you've got to make that opposite strand before you can make the positive strand again. So that's what these they RNA replicase. I like to call them RNA-dependent RNA polymerases. Um, they will make more of the positive strand, some of which will get translated again to make more of the virus proteins, but some of it will get put together with these proteins, and you end up with a virion that can come out on the outside. So that's the overall process. Just one example of this is the poliovirus genome, probably the best studied of these positive strand RNA viruses. This particular virus has a replication strategy, which is very common for these positive strand RNA viruses. It's what's called be making a polyprotein. So there's just one big open reading frame in the RNA that comes in when you have the infection process. And then this one big protein gets chopped into little pieces 
by a viral protease. So the viral protease, which is actually being translated as part of this one big massive protein, chops itself out of that massive protein and then chops the rest of the protein into smaller pieces. And it's all of these smaller pieces that can now come together to make these wonderful, beautiful, at least in my totally biased point of view, um, virion here with really nice icosahedral symmetry. Here you can see one of the 12 pentameric structures um, right up here at the top. And then in this case, there are hexameric structures that come in between all of those. But it's all coming from one big protein that gets chopped into smaller pieces afterward. So let's look at one example of a negative strand RNA virus. This is which one? People in virology? What's this very distinctive virion here? Rabies, so also known as a, what family? Rhabdovirus, exactly. So classic negative strand RNA virus comes into the cell. Here, it has to have its own replicase, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that comes with it. That makes messenger RNAs for the individual proteins they are going to have to come together to make this particular virion. At a certain time, this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase then decides, which has to do with the concentration of these individual proteins, that it's now going to make antigenomes, this is now positive strand, and then full-length genomes instead of messenger RNAs. And this has all to do with the concentration of individual proteins that have been made here as a timing mechanism. These negative strand RNAs now get packaged together with this RNA pattern RNA polymerase. Because remember, you can't do anything if you come in with a negative strand genome. You've got to make the messenger RNAs from that genome once you actually get inside the cell. So the last one I wanted to talk about are the retroviruses. So we're getting ahead of virology now, so this is new stuff for all the people in the virology class. These are, again, as I mentioned before, the ones that David Baltimore and Howard Temin found. They package a positive strand in their virion, but go through a double-stranded DNA intermediate. So how the heck does that happen? Well, what happens is, just like you have in these negative-strand RNA viruses, you have the reverse transcriptase. The protein now that will make the DNA copy comes in with the virion. So protein present in the virion. So just like you have with the negative strand RNA viruses, you have the reverse transcriptase, also known as a RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, because it's an RNA template to make DNA from, that comes in with the virion. So that comes in. You have lots of really cool replication processes that take place that we'll talk about in virology in about a month. Uh, and then you end up with a double-stranded copy of the RNA that you had at the beginning here with some extra repeat structures at either end of the genome. This then gets put into the host genome. Yeah. We're going from single-stranded RNA to double-stranded DNA. Yes. So that gets back to another comment about these reverse transcriptases. So I called it an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. It's actually the reverse transcriptase that also makes the double-stranded DNA. So it's not just an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. It's also a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So it's just the reverse transcriptase that takes that single-stranded RNA and makes a double-stranded DNA from it. And all of that can actually happen in the, ooh, nice uh, circle there. Um, all of that happens then in the actual virion. So as the infection process is taking place, this double-stranded DNA is actually made. That double-stranded DNA then gets put into the genome of the host. Question or stretch? <laughs> So the question is, has the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase been repurposed or reused? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. <laughs> Making cDNAs and things like that. 
Yeah, so the you know, question is, so what, what, what use would an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase be? So there have been some applications for detecting very small amounts of RNA. They've been done with RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, interestingly enough, from some of the bacterial um, RNA viruses, um, Q-beta in particular. So it's a way of making very, very large copies of one particular RNA, mostly for detection purposes, and particularly for detection purposes of things like HIV that have really small amounts of RNA that are in them, and so just using that to amplify RNA. It turns out that those enzymes are not as robust as the, not so much the reverse transcriptases aren't particularly robust, but certainly the PCR enzymes. So amplifying DNA is way, way, way easier than amplifying RNA. Yeah, Eddie. Did I say that? <laughs> I said that it's actually the activity of the reverse transcriptase can be active in the virion as it's coming into the cell. And so we didn't talk too much about this, but all of these enveloped viruses, the way that they get inside a cell is usually by fusing their membrane with the host membrane. And so what happens in this case is you release this nucleocapsid present in the middle here. And it's in there that you actually get that activity. So that activity of the RNA being made into DNA for a single strand and that single strand of DNA being made into double stranded. So all of this process happens here. Yeah? Where, where does the virus get its nucleotides in order to do that? In the cytoplasm of the host cell. Because it's, once it's come in, you fuse the two membranes. Now this is in the cytoplasm of the host. There it's actually got those nucleotides that it can use. Okay, so just finishing up. Um, hopefully this should look familiar to you. Genome sizes, right? You know, mammals up here, pretty big genomes. This is the haploid genome. Bacteria and archaea, smaller genomes. But, you know, everyone said, you know, originally at the beginning, very small genomes for these viruses. Some are really small, 1.8 thousand bases. Um, bacteriophage get up to about 170 KB. You talked about some of the really, really small bacteria, some of the carcinellas, the tiny genome ones, symbionts. So some of the smallest bacterial genomes are actually right about 200,000 base pairs. But what's been discovered in the last 10, 15 years now are bigger and bigger and bigger viruses. And I love this name, the megaviruses here, um, also known as the giant viruses. Larger and larger genomes are being found. And this particular figure from the textbook is actually kind of out of date because there are now virions that have two and a half million base pair genomes which is actually getting up to the size of some of the smallest eukaryotic genomes. The Pandora virus? No, actually there's a one in science which is a slightly smaller genome than that. But yeah, than the Pandora virus, but it's also... Yeah, that was the one that uh, JGI, yeah, the JGI paper. So that one, but it's actually, it's not actually the biggest. Um, Pandora virus is slightly bigger. But there are quite a few viruses that have mega base pair genomes, millions of base pairs of their genomes, which is just, I don't know, at least for me, is crazy. Yeah. Larger organisms. A great question. So basically, what do these giant viruses infect? The vast majority of giant viruses so far have been found in infect amoeba, which are larger organisms, certainly, than you have in terms of bacteria. Strangely enough, some of these amoeba have way bigger genomes, even than most mammals. So maybe there's a connection there between the host having a really big genome and some of the viruses having really big genomes. I mentioned when I showed you our tree with the three domains of life, just in case someone asked you that question on a midterm. Uh, there are large numbers of organisms 
for which we have no described viruses whatsoever. And a lot of the unicellular eukaryotes, like amoeba, have a large number of these giant viruses that are associated with them. So algae, um, some of the protozoa, many of these have some of these giant viruses that are associated with them. But so few people have been studying them that practically every week, you know, every, every other week in science, you have another one of these you know, giant viruses that people find. Okay, so with that, I wanted to switch gears and talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing in my lab, um, just here over in SRTC, um, having to do with archaeal viruses. Um, this is, as Anna Louise mentioned, when I was doing my postdoctoral work with Wolfram Zillig. What she forgot to mention, I was a postdoc with Wolfram Zillig. Carl Stetter was a postdoc with Wolfram Zillig. We actually had one drawer that still said Carlos Stetter on it in, in the lab. So uh, I'm connected at least in that way with Carl Stetter. There are all kinds of other reasons that I don't necessarily want to be connected with Carl Stetter. But I also don't drive a Ferrari, but that's a different story. Um, so we got very interested in Archaea when I started working in Wolfram Zillig's lab. I actually wanted to work on transcription, but then um, they're working on these really cool viruses, so I saw the error of my ways and started to become a, a virologist, quote unquote. So one of the reasons that archaeal viruses are so fascinating is they just don't look like any virus anybody's ever seen before. Um, they have these kinds of you know, really bizarre like structures. This is a 3D printed model of our favorite virus that we work with in the lab, um, SSV1. But there are all kinds of other ones. One of my favorites, but not one that we work on, is this particular virus. This is the virion of the aptly named Acidionis bottle-shaped virus. It really does kind of look like a champagne bottle um, with kind of a cork at one end and then would almost look like birthday candles around the other end. How the heck do you fit one, uh, make a structure like this out of different proteins? Hugely interesting question that we have basically absolutely no idea um, how it works. Um, Acidionis filamentous virus. These guys are ridiculously long. They're almost two microns in length. The poor microbes that they infect, this is an Archaebacterium acidionis, uh, has a diameter of about one micron. So the virion is twice the length of the cell that it's actually infecting. If you do an electron micrograph in an infected cell, it looks like this whole you know, bunch of spaghetti which has been you know, crammed inside this cell. Um, really amazing. They also have these nano-sized hooks at the end of the virion. This little hook closes on pili um, when you actually have the infection process. Um, sort of the smallest hooks that I've ever seen. And then another really fascinating virion that David Prangishvili has worked on, and David Prangishvili's desk was right next to mine in Wolfram Zillig's lab done some really amazing stuff um, since then, probably because I wasn't there to bug him all the time, um, is this Acidionis, also two-tailed virus. These guys start out looking like SSVs, like these guys over here. But if you incubate them outside the cell, they grow these tails at either the end of the virion, um, which seem to be important for the infection process. How that happens, again, is a, a really open question in terms of how you get these really interesting morphologies. But as I mentioned, we have our nice little model here. Um, the Fusello viruses, this is one of those virions here attached to a little piece of cell debris. The actual cell here would be about the size of the <coughs> whole slide here. Um, why do we study these things? Pretty much because they're there. Um, anytime you find an appropriate environment, which is high temperature and low pH, You'll find viruses that look like this, either in the genome of the host or just free floating around in that particular hot spring. Um, we're interested in the shape and how the heck a shape like this actually gets put together. I told you, you know, helices, icosahedra are great, but how the heck do you make something that looks like this? Or how, even more crazy, how do you make something that looks like a bottle, um, relatively speaking? So we're very interested in that. We also are interested in how all of the genes work. Um, I didn't have a chance to put our paper in there. It was just on the cover of the journal Virology. Check it out from two weeks ago. Um, Double-stranded DNA genome. But I did want to talk a little bit about the structure. This is from the cover 
no one looks at covers of journals anymore, so you've got to print out a big, pretty copy and hang it on your wall. Um, so this is from the, the journal, Virology. There's a journal of virology, which is a different journal, um, from 2015. And in the background here is actually one of the environments that you find um, some of these particular viruses in. Um, we determine the structure, and when I say we, I mean our collaborators at the University of Texas Medical Branch took many, many pictures of these virions and averaged them all together. And we ended up with this structure right here. Probably the most exciting thing in terms of this structure has to do with this tail down here at the bottom. We just, all we saw before was a little blob that was present at the end of these viruses. Now we could see that it has a really nice, clearly six-fold symmetric tail, which is probably interacting with the host. Quite how that's working, I have a graduate student who's working on this right now. Another thing that my collaborators noticed that they thought was really interesting was that the structure could actually be approximated by something that looks like a really messed up soccer ball. <laughs> and when I mentioned right at the beginning, when we talked about these structures, all you need to have a plane of hexameric subunits hexameric pieces come together in a closed shape is 12 pentamers. So you have a whole sheet of hexamers, take out one of those from 12 places, and that will cause the structure to fold into a closed unit. Why were we so interested in this? Well, it turns out that HIV and that nucleocapsid, the thing in the middle where you have the activity of the reverse transcriptase, has a structure which also has bizarre sort of combinations of soccer ball at one end, slightly different at the other end, a whole bunch of hexameric six-fold symmetries in between. Here, our model is we have a really tiny soccer ball here, a really huge one in the middle, and half of one here. So this process, what we call a fullerene cone, it's basically a derivation of this kind of icosahedral symmetry, might be, despite these things looking really, really different, actually being a different kind of model in terms of structures of how virions come together. Now, we talk about this comparison in our paper. You know, our paper was in virology. This one came out in Nature. Um, but what happened was the press got all nuts about this. You know, PSU biologists discover HIV-like virus. No, it's not an HIV-like virus. <laughs> it's a virus that has a structure that might be similar in a very, very, very broad sense to HIV. But heck, you know, got to get these you know, local news. Uh, say Professor Unlocks lead to drugs for HIV. This picture should look vaguely familiar from that video I showed you a little bit earlier on. Uh, this actually might be true, um, some drugs for HIV, because if it does turn out that ours has that kind of structure with these not real icosahedra but different kinds of pieces fitting together, maybe that'll tell us something about the structure of HIV. Maybe. Big, big, big maybe there. So this environment right here um, is a place where we've been going actually probably about, about 15 years now. A um, place called Boiling Springs Lake, um, just off of the Pacific Crest Trail in Lassen Volcanic National Park. A, it's really beautiful, and B, um, it's a place which nobody's really studied very much. Um, and it's pretty easy to get to. So this is a place where we've actually had some funding, ran out a couple of years ago now, um, to study the microbial ecosystem in this what I like to call the largest hot spring in the world that nobody's ever heard of, um, Boiling Springs Lake um, in Lassen Volcanic National Park. This is a lake. It's actually a pretty good-sized lake. It's about 100 meters by 200 meters. The low temperature in this system is 50 degrees Celsius. The high temperature is about 95 degrees, um, and the pH is about 2. So it's a pretty nasty ecosystem, and for some reason my students didn't want to go out in the middle of the lake and collect samples. Go figure. Why not? So we had the engineers design this little boat um, here, remote controlled boat, to go out on the lake and collect samples for us. Um, the Jolly Roger on top was actually their idea, not ours. 
so we were working together with the group at Humboldt State University who are isolating bacteria and archaea from this system. Found some really interesting um, archaea in this system as well as some bacteria. But one of the really fascinating things that we're really excited about is that 50 degrees Celsius is just about the top of the range that you can find eukaryotes that can survive under these conditions. And so we were really hoping we'd find viruses um, in this particular environment. We tried really hard to find these guys. No success whatsoever. So then in, we did metagenomics, which you've talked about metagenomics, kind of, sort of. So um, we did something called virus metagenomics, which is what we did is we got all those little green dots, remember, the little tiny things, got rid of all that you know, boring bacteria and archaea, and then just got all the nucleic acids out, amplified them like mad, and then tried to put their sequences together. Um, to do this, you need graduate students um, to get large amounts of material out of the lake. Um, this is Eric Iverson, who just graduated from my lab uh, a couple of years ago, and Jeff Diemer, who did most of the work I'm going to talk about here a little bit later on. And this is carrying out the liters and liters of sediment that we needed to do this. So we sequenced the genome. We took a look. No one wants to go outside. It's pouring with rain. So we can keep talking for a couple minutes now. Uh, <laughs> so we took those genomes. We sequenced them. I say the metagenome, all the nucleic acid we could find. We sequenced the heck out of it. At that point actually was 400,000 sequences, which now is nothing relative to metagenomes. But in those 400,000 sequences, we actually found some sequences that looked a little bit like um, these kinds of viruses. So they're probably there. But we found this really bizarre set of sequences down here that looked like RNA viruses. Now, this was so bizarre because we actually tried really hard to get RNA sequences out of this environment. Zero luck whatsoever. But then when we took those sequences and compared them to the sequences that you could find in databases, our DNA sequences looked like RNA viruses. Now, if you remember back to those, you know, RNA virus has a positive strand or a negative strand that goes to a positive strand, makes viral proteins. There's no DNA in there at all, unless it's a retrovirus. So to make a long story short, what we ended up finding was this thing called, or we called it, the Boiling Springs Lake RNA-DNA hybrid virus, which looks like it's got about half of the genome that looks like a single-stranded DNA virus, and the other half that looks like single-stranded RNA viruses. So what looked like happened is we had a recombination event between a single-stranded DNA virus and a single stranded RNA virus. This is totally unheard of, how this kind of recombination should be taking place. But it's generated something that looks like a DNA virus has somehow stolen this capsid protein gene. So I like to call this the green pig virus. Why do I call it the green pig virus? Because it turns out that the most similar sequence here is a porcine circovirus, and the one down here is tomato bushy stunt virus. So I call this the green pig virus. Um, why are we interested in these you know, sort of green pig viruses? It's really a chimeric virus, how these things fit together. So the chimera, hopefully all of you are up on your Etruscan pottery. Um, <laughs> lion's head, tail of a snake, head of a goat. Um, but this may be how new virus diseases actually come about um, for this recombination process. And this is what we got funded by NASA to do. And I'll stop there.